Good morning. I'm Pastor John. I'm the campus pastor in Raymond here at Bethany, and I'm glad to be with you. It's been a little bit. It's been about a year since I've been with you, and I'm glad to be back. Glad to have some family and friends, but then many of you that I meet on Monday or Tuesday or throughout the week, I see you, but I don't see you on Sunday, so I'm honored to be here. God is doing something at Bethany. It's exciting to be a local and growing up here and coming back and now serving here and seeing how God is working now in Maine and New Hampshire and throughout New England. And I'd ask if you bow with me before we go into God's word, we'll ask his blessing on this morning's service. Heavenly Father, as we look into your word this morning, I'm humbled to be able to look at the character of Christ and to be able to stop the busyness of our day and bring your people before the throne of God now and then into your word. So I ask that you would open our minds to understand a little bit more about who we are in light of the gospel. May you help us to understand not only who we are, but then how you've called us to live because of that new reality we have in Christ. And we pray these things in Christ's name and for Christ's sake. Amen. Well, I'd like to start by showing you a picture. That is what is called a selfie. Now, I'm not a very crazy person, but my wife said, take a funny picture, and that's about as funny as I get. So that's a picture of my daughter, Samantha, and I, and the picture you see is one of millions that's on the internet. It's what's been dubbed today as the self-portrait of our digital age. Today, probably all of you, let's say half of you, will see some sort of self-portrait someone else is going to take with their phone, and they're going to post it on the internet for the whole world to see. And I thought I'd start out this morning's service by taking a moment and reading for you a commentary on what a selfie is. Now, a selfie is simply starting with a picture taken by a camera or a smartphone. Now, I don't have my phone with me, but a smartphone is usually tilted about 45 degrees above your eye line because that's the most forgiving angle. And as I'm reading this, you're probably starting to say, yeah, that's what I do. So then you have a light source. Either it's a backlit window or for many, it's a bursting flash from the camera in a mirror in your home. Now, you have to have an important pose. You want to have a good raise of the eyebrows to show self-awareness a sideways smile, and then some people like to mess up their hair to make it look like they look beautiful and they just got out of bed. But then they take the picture. Now, afterwards, a flattering filter is applied. Outlines are blurred, colors are softened, tints soak through, and you sometimes have a nice tint that looks like a vinyl record or something from the 60s. And then, all of this is done within seconds and it's uploaded to Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, Snapchat, and then you put a hashtag on it. Now, as you think of this, this image I have not put online, but this image is retweeted, tagged, and shared, and your screen fills with thumbs-up signs, heart-shaped images called emojis. Now, you are liked several times over. You feel a shiver of, what exactly? Reassurance, the author says existential calm, Whatever it is, it's addictive. Soon you repeat the whole process, trying a different pose. Again and again, you offer yourself up for public viewing. This then is the selfie, the self-portrait of the digital age. We're all at it to some degree. Just type selfie into the Twitter bar or look at Instagram where last night to have the most updated information, there are 305 and a half million photos with the hashtag me on the internet. So ladies and gentlemen, this is the culture in which we live. For good or for bad, people in their cars, in their homes, wherever they are, in front of their supper or breakfast, they're hashtagging pictures, not of society, not of the world, but of themselves. We live in a very self-centered society, a society that calls to elevate the individual over anyone else. And in the midst of this society, our Savior Christ has called us to follow him, but not follow him out in front with our pictures, not out in front with our hands raised, but to follow him selflessly, to follow him humbly. So this morning, as we look through our Advent series at the character of Christ, I've been asked to talk on the topic of the humility of Christ. 
And as I thought of that topic, I said to myself, it's almost impossible to think about humility in a day and age in which we live. So a question came to mind that by God's grace, I'd like to answer. How can we cultivate a heart of humility? How can we be humble followers of Christ? Turn, if you would, in your Bibles to the book of Philippians. We'll have the text on the screen for you. But in the book of Philippians, the Apostle Paul is writing to a church he founded in the first century. And in this church, he's noticing some trends that are trends that are happening in every church throughout history. And that is the topic of selfishness. So Paul begins by giving a process, a very simple process, by which an individual can work on this character quality of humility. And he begins in verse 1 of chapter, uh, Philippians chapter 1 and verse 27. Notice with me, Paul starts to talk about how we can remember God's grace. So Paul says in Philippians 1 and verse 27, Whatever happens, conduct yourselves in a manner worthy of the gospel of Christ. Then whether I come and see you or only hear about you in my absence, I will know that you stand firm in the one spirit, striving together as one for the faith of the gospel. He tells them to live a life that is worthy of the gospel. We'll now go to chapter 2 and verse 1. Paul says, Therefore, if you have any encouragement from being united with Christ, if any comfort from his love if any common sharing in the spirit, if any tenderness and compassion. I'm going to stop mid-sentence there because in verse 1, Paul is giving a number of conditional sentences. And often we use conditional sentences all day. If you have children, you say to your children, if you clean your room, or if you pick up, like I do, if you pick up a toy, because I have small expectations, if you pick up a toy, then you can and you have a benefit. So it's the benefit, the then part of the sentence, is conditioned upon the obedience at the beginning. Well, Paul is not writing in that regard with conditional sentences. He's writing here with the word if to state these things have already happened. They're assured to already be true. So Paul is writing in chapter 1 of verse 2, and he's saying not really if you have any encouragement. You could say because you have encouragement in Christ. Because you have comfort from his love, because you share in a common spirit, because you've received tenderness and compassion. These realities is what's going to fuel Paul to teach them to remember God's grace. You go in the Old Testament, you see, in, I thought of particularly in Deuteronomy, Moses said to the Israelites over and over again, remember Remember what he did. Remember what you were in Egypt as slaves. Remember the food that you ate. Remember how God parted the waters. He constantly, if you look up the word remember in the scriptures, God is constantly reminding us of the things that have happened in the past by God's grace to bring us where we are today. Now, you might think I'm here because of my own actions and because of my own sweat and my own tears. But in God's view, you're here because God led you here. When we think of success, I'm reading a book with my son by a, it's about a missionary, a missionary by the name of Moffat. And he's in Africa and he says to his friend at 20, you know, when I'm 33, after I'm done medical school, I'm gonna go be a missionary. And his friend said, no, 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 at 33, you're gonna be questioning why at 33, you're not more far well known and more popular. Because as we get older, we think we need to achieve success. And that success is built upon our own efforts and our own trials. But Paul is not telling them to look back at what they've done. He's telling them to remember God's grace. So what I thought we'd do, before we go in and look more into God's word, I'd like to take 10 seconds and give you 10 seconds to just ask you, and I want you to think about God's grace in your life. Think about the things that God has done to lead you here. Those moments that and you, no, you had no hope but God and God answered. Those prayers that you prayed that God didn't answer. So for 10 seconds, and I'll watch the clock, take a few seconds and think about God's grace in your own life.
10 seconds isn't very long. For someone that's standing up front, staring at a congregation, it feels like a long time. But for you, 10 seconds, you probably only thought of one thing. But some of you might have thought, yeah, God didn't leave me here. Because look at all the things I've done. I thought of this. I took this exercise. I watched, actually, Mr. Rogers at an Emmy Award-winning presentation. He talked and he paused with all of the celebrities in Hollywood, and he said, I will watch my clock, and let's take 10 seconds and thank, think of those that have led us here. And I watched the audience. And some of the people were crying, but most of the people, they were just staring at Mr. Rogers like he was a fool. Because it's very easy for us to think we are here because of ourselves. That's why Paul doesn't just tell them, remember God's grace. He then goes on to tell them, you need to recognize your pride. Because as quickly as grace comes up, our pride lifts its ugly head to remind us that, no, 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 don't forget me. So look in verse 2. Paul says, here's the second part of the conditional sentence. Then make my joy complete by being like-minded, having the same love being one in spirit and of one mind. Do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit. Paul is talking to a church where they had a problem, just like Bethany Church, just like every church in America. Individual selfishness and pride. Pride is our greatest enemy because as James tells us, and Peter, God resists or God opposes the proud. But why is that? Why is James telling us that, that God opposes those that are proud? Well, pride contends for supremacy with God himself. It attempts to elevate the sinner above the Savior. In all of creation, God is to be preeminent. But when we walk around thinking we achieve something, when we're the focus point of our own lives, what we're telling God is we're more important than him. We don't need him. Pride is self-obsession, a preoccupation with ourselves, an orientation that wrongly assumes that everything revolves around me. I recently saw an article about Machu Picchu in Peru, and it's this city that's on top of a mountain, and they found it. It was tucked away for years, and they say now that thousands of people are going to this city, and what's happening is they're starting to take things. And I honestly thought to myself, well, it wouldn't really be bad if I took something. Because like, I'm never going to go there again, so why can't I take a rock? But what if all 70,000 people thought it's okay for me to take something, not everyone else? It's difficult to spot pride, though, because it's a shape-changing sin. Hard to spot, even more difficult to kill. That's why pride has been called the most hidden, secret, and deceitful of all sins. And here's why. I, right now, am able to pastor with four other, three other pastors. We have Reverend Dirk Rogers. We have Reverend Bruce Boria. We have Tim Carpenter, who has been in ministry far longer than me. And then I have myself. And we get to do a pastor's meeting. And when we're sitting there, it's really interesting because I'm just learning. I'm taking notes. Dirk says something, I write it down. Bruce says something, I write it down. Sometimes they stop and they make a joke and they say, John, this is something you're not supposed to do in ministry. Remember this. And I take a note, write it down. Well, sometimes I say something and all of a sudden the meeting kind of like changes course. And I leave the meeting and I'm like, dude, that was good. Like I said that and Bruce went, that was a good point, John. It's Bruce, that was awesome. So I make a note and then I realize, oh man, I'm fighting, pr that's pride. It wasn't my thought. It's all of us working together. That's why we're all in the same room together. So I say, you know, I hate my pride. I'm going to work on that. Now, this may just be me. Hap this happens to me. But then I leave the meeting, and I start to think, you know, I'm pretty good at, like, you know, I was a battle with pride, and I squash that pride. <laughs> like, I, really, this happens. You guys might say, this may not happen to you. Then I'm like, you know, I wonder if those pastors know how much I'm struggling with pride, but how good I'm doing at struggling with it. <laughs> so I struggle with it, and then I go, oh, are you kidding me? I'm being proud that I'm fighting with pride. <laughs> so I don't know if that happens to you, but me, as I've said to our congregation in Raymond, I like preaching because I like to expound God's word, but I have to be careful. I like, don't like preaching because it can be all about me. 
So we remember God's grace, but then we have to recognize our pride. But recognizing our pride isn't the only thing we can do. We then have to respond with humility. Let's continue reading in verse 3. Paul says, after telling them to not focus on their pride, he says, rather, in humility, value others above yourselves, not looking to your own interests, but each of you to the interests of others. Now, the Greek word humility, like we have in English, lowliness of mind, the correct estimation of ourselves. And when I think of that word, I wanted to study humility, but not just know what humility is, really to be able to understand how I can apply this to my life. So humility isn't just thinking too highly of ourselves. Like, okay, humility, I can't think too highly of myself, and I can't think too lowly of myself. I thought that's a good definition of pride. But then I realized, excuse me, of humility, but humility is just not thinking much of yourself at all. We can go get so fixated on thinking so lowly of ourselves, we're missing the whole point. We're still proud. It's not saying that you're nothing and you're worthless walking around with your head down. It's walking, your head, walking around with your head not even focusing on yourself at all. It's really fundamentally a form of self-forgetfulness as opposed to pride's self-fixation. Having a realistic sense of who we are before God and others. It's interesting, but when you were born, the world didn't stop. If you notice, you were probably one of maybe 20 or 30 babies born in that hospital. I remember when my first son was born, I thought everyone you know, would be all excited. I walk out in the hall and there's another baby crying. And all the nurses are over there now. And then another baby's born. And I realized that moment, yeah, that child is important to my family and he's important to those people, but that child's not the center of the world, though they may think that's the case. And when it comes to humility, Jonathan Edwards said, we must view humility as one of the most essential things that characterizes true Christianity. We must view humility as one of the most essential things that characterizes true Christianity. Now, if I was to ask you what characterizes true Christianity, I would probably, I would guess that humility was not on the list. You would think a strong faith. You would think a determination. You would think as that wonderful movie, Courageous. You would think of these action words in which we are the center, acting out our following Christ. But if you follow Christ very long, you learn to realize that Christ really isn't focused on you getting your name out or you being known. Over and over again, he's had people come and serve him, and they're never known. But he's known. So Paul gives these three, you could say, keys or steps to cultivating humility, but instead of just stopping and saying, all right, go and do this, as often is the case, I'm very much task-oriented, he stops and he tells them, now I want you to look at the example of Christ. I want you to align yourselves with how Jesus lived. Because aren't we supposed to be Christians, little Christ? So turn now to verse 5. Paul starts to speak of the humility of Christ. And he says in verse 5, in your relationships with one another, have the same mindset as Christ Jesus. You notice Paul starts with the mind. In Romans, he says, you need to transform yourself by the renewing of your mind. I know when I meet with people, I tell them, I'm not focused on your outward actions when I meet them. I'm focused on their heart. Because I've seen people that they live outwardly so well. They look so good, but their heart is black as sin. But then I meet people that God gets a hold of their heart, and then all of a sudden those things, you're like, you shouldn't be doing that. They come up to me and they say, you know, I shouldn't be doing this. And I'm like, I didn't preach on that. I didn't, I didn't nag them. I didn't talk to them. They're growing as God gets a hold of their heart. But then in verse 6, he says, who, speaking of Jesus, being in the very nature of God, did not consider equality with God something to be used to his own advantage. Verse 6 is starting to describe Jesus before he came to earth. Christ is going to respond to the Father with humility. And it shows us here, he says in verse 6, who being in very nature God. Now when we think of the term nature, if I was to say that's just my human nature, that would be describing my reality of who I am. One commentator calls it inner essence of who you are. Why do I sit? Why do I walk? Why do I do the things I do? Well, some of it we say, oh, that's just human nature. Well, 
Paul is describing Jesus as God in every way, shape, and form. There's often been a debate, well, Jesus is never called God in the Bible. Well, this is a clear description of Jesus being God in every way. But then Paul goes on to describe how Christ did not hesitate to set aside his own self-willed interests as God and become a man. Now, what are some of Christ's self-willed interests? Well, if you remember in the Old Testament, Moses saw God, the hind parts of God, the backside of God, and his face shone so much that he had to put a veil over him. Well, do you remember Jesus' face shining when he was born in the manger? Now, I know in our pictures we have the star shining directly on Jesus and all the animals at the cleanest farm in the world, and it's a beautiful picture of the manger. But Jesus came as a child in a manger, and there was no glory received by him. The best self-interest for Jesus is to receive the glory and honor that he's due. But he didn't do that. Instead, in verse 7, if you'll read, we see that Jesus, he made himself nothing. It says, rather, he made himself nothing by taking the very nature of a servant, by being made in human likeness. The Greek word behind nothing literally means emptied himself. His divine prerogatives he set aside for the sake of us. As God, he had all the rights of deity, yet during his incarnate state, he surrendered his rights. Now, if I was God and Pilate was to criticize or to harass me or to torture me, I promise you I would have lashed out at Pilate and ended this whole Christian story, and we'd all be in heaven. But Jesus didn't do that. There's an old hymn, he could have called 10,000 angels, but he didn't. If I was on a cross, I have no right to call 10,000 angels, but Jesus had the right, and the Father could have said nothing against him because that was his right. But he gave that all up. He embraced perfect humanity. And notice if you would in verse 8, Christ, he learns obedience. It says, In being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to death, even death on a cross. When I read this verse a few weeks ago, I've read it many, many times, I never noticed the phrase, two words, become obedient. Now, I sat there and I think, all right, what does that mean? Because as a child, I became obedient through, through discipline. I was sitting, I was disobedient, my parents said, do this, and then I said, no, and then something happened, and then I said, okay, now I will be obedient. I went from sin, or I went from selfishness, to obedience. Well, Jesus didn't go from sin or from disobedience to obedience. This is a description of Jesus going from obedience at one level to a deeper level of obedience. Throughout Jesus' life, he had to obey the Father. And it culminated with Jesus saying, Father, if you are willing, take this cup from me. Yet not my will, but yours be done. That was Jesus being obedient. He grew in obedience. And this is what it truly means for us to value others above ourselves. I like that idea, but I don't like it lived out practically because it hurts. It hurts my pride. I want you to listen to James chapter 4 and verse 6. I read the beginning of it. God opposes the proud, but gives grace to the humble. Very quickly, let us look at how God lifted up the sun. In verse 9, Paul says, Therefore God exalted him to the highest place and gave him the name that is above every name, that at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue acknowledge that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Why are we in this room this morning? Why are countless Christians around the world, and for centuries, why did they come together to worship? We came to worship the name of Jesus. We didn't come to exalt ourselves or to lift ourselves up. And Jesus when he obeyed and he humbled himself, God lifted him up. As a kid, I remember at vacation Bible school, 
we would sing a song, humble yourself in the sight of the Lord and he will lift you up. Higher, higher, and higher. I'm not going to sing the song for you. But as I think of that song, I realize how true it is. How often have we humbled ourselves and without even meaning to, God gives us more and more influence. When we make ourselves low, he makes our, us high. We are in a battle. And for the last 18 months, we've been really pressing with you, as Pastor Tim, Tim said earlier, to be disciples and make disciples. But what I wanted to bring up this morning is that this calling of ours, we cannot allow ourselves to get too fixated on the task that we have to accomplish to the point that we look at ourselves and say, look how good of a disciple I am. Look at how much I'm doing. Because all of us as pastors have talked about this. We know if this is going to happen, it's going to happen by people humbling themselves before God, seeking his face, and asking him to do the work. We'll just be the mouthpiece. Now, if I was to ask you how many of you are going to go home and put a picture on Instagram or Twitter or Facebook, I'm not saying that's a bad thing. But I brought that up to begin with because cultivating a heart of humility does not happen overnight. And that's an example of how easily we can lift ourselves up. Cultivating a heart of humility is rather like peeling an onion. You cut away one layer only to find another beneath it that's even thicker and harder to peel back. The peeling is going to hurt. The peeling is going to take God humbling you, showing you who you really are. It's going to take us humbling ourselves before him. I don't know about you, but I'd rather humble myself than God humble me, because he's done it many, quite many times, and I don't like it. But by God's grace, he will conform us to the image of his son, and he will humble us. As we forsake pride and seek humility daily by submitting ourselves, humility will grow in our souls. It is well said that humility is not a grace that can be acquired in a few months. It takes a work of a lifetime. However, as we grow in humility, God will exalt all those who embrace it and increase their influence for the kingdom of God. For we're all here for one purpose, to exalt the name of Jesus. May we as a church arise to the calling he's called us to live. But may we arise as we humble ourselves before him and praise and glorify his name. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, I thank you that you've given me the opportunity to learn humility through the many examples in my life that you've brought me through. I thank you for these people and how they've come here to church this morning to worship not their own name, but to worship the name of your son. And I pray that you would start to cultivate a heart of humility within us as we follow and look at the example of our Savior who lived as a man who was tempted in all points as we are, yet without sin. And Lord, I pray that as you look into our heart of hearts and you hear our words, that may our words and our actions mirror and reflect only that of which is in our heart. And I pray, Lord, at the end of this day, that you will be the name that is remembered and glorified. It's in Christ's name that we pray. Amen.